Throughout the history of the web, the two most popular web servers have always been first the Apache web server, called formerly Apache HTTP server, and Microsoft's server called IIS, which stands for Internet Information Services. Uh, Apache has about a 60% market share these days, actually a bit higher than that, and Microsoft is somewhere around 15%. The success of the Apache web server, aside from its quality, is undoubtedly due to it being open source. It's free software. And whereas Apache runs on basically every platform, from Linux to Windows to Mac and uh, a bunch of others, IIS, on the other hand, only runs in Windows. In fact, it's actually not really sort of marketed as a separate program. It's built into Windows itself. It's a Windows feature, at least as Microsoft presents it. And in fact, in most versions of Windows, you'll have IIS installed automatically, though um, in some of the cheaper versions, like the, the home basic versions, you'll have to uh, get it as a separate download. But it's free if you already have Windows, at least. Generally, though, if you're running a real website with some serious amount of traffic and you choose IIS, you'd likely want to run that on the, the version of Windows called Windows Server. When it comes down to a choice between the two, however, Apache and IIS, I would generally always pick Apache. If, for whatever reason, you use a bunch of other proprietary Microsoft stuff like uh, Active Directory and other sorts of uh, Windows Server things they have, then it makes sense to use IIS if you've already committed to the whole Microsoft path. Otherwise, I find it hard to justify using IIS instead of Apache. Uh, be clear about the Apache web server. While commonly we often just say Apache to mean the Apache web server, Apache is actually this, this whole organization with uh, numerous open source software projects. Uh, the web server is just one of those. It was the first one and it's still the most popular, but it's one among many. So Apache, strictly speaking, refers to an organization and the particular open source license which they use for their software. As for some other open source web servers, there's what's called NGIX and another called LightTPD. I don't know how to pronounce that really, if it's LightHTTPD or, or what. I just say LightTPD. Anyway, both of these have become pretty popular in recent years. NGIX is something like 8%, 10% of the market now, and, and LightTPD maybe has 5%. Both of these have become popular mainly because they're simple stripped-down web servers that uh, mainly focus on uh, serving many, many concurrent requests quickly. So they're very high-performant for uh, those kinds of use cases. With the trade-off, though, that they lack some of the features of Apache. Uh, despite liking these features, or arguably because of it, both of these web servers are popularly used as what's called a, a proxy, either a forward proxy or, more often, a reverse proxy. So, what are forward and reverse proxies? Well, in what we might think of as the normal case, a web server receives a request from some user agent, some web browser, and it returns an HTTP response to that user. Uh, when acting as a proxy, however, uh, the web server will take the request and actually pass it on to something else. So it doesn't really process the request itself and return response, it passes it on. Then the proxy, once it gets back the response it sent along, it then returns the response to the original requester. The difference between a forward and a reverse proxy then is where the proxy is located, in proximity to the requesting browser and the responding web server. The distinction is not always hard and fast, but a forward proxy we usually think of as positioned in the immediate network of the requesting user agent itself. So say you work at a company and that company has its own local network that's connected to the internet, um, but they configure their network such that all of the computers on it have to use the forward proxy in the network to go out to the web. If you look in your operating system's network configuration, you'll see there are options for specifying a proxy. And that's where you configure the system to use a forward proxy. Now the question is, well, what's the point of using a forward proxy? Well, there are many different reasons. Uh, in an organization like a, a business, you don't want your uh, users to uh, go to certain websites, so you use the proxy uh, as a, effectively as a filter on what sites they can visit. Um, that's one reason. It can also uh, provide some extra security in certain circumstances. Maybe you just want to keep a record, a log of all the activity of your uh, workers, what they do on the web. That's something a forward proxy can do. So that's the gist of why we might use a forward proxy. It's mainly about security and controlling access. With what's called a reverse proxy, the proxy is placed next to a web server and sits between the web server and the requests coming in from the internet. This also can be useful for various different purposes, but those purposes mainly are about, again, security, but more commonly just about performance. 
for example, very often a proxy is used as a load balancer. That is, it's a single machine that takes in all the initial requests, um, but then it farms those requests out to multiple other web servers. It's balancing the load between those other web servers, and those web servers are the ones that actually take the request and, and generate the real response. Another way in which a reverse proxy might improve performance is if it acts as a cache. So you get certain frequent repetitive requests coming into a web server rather than have the proper web server, the one that usually generates most of the requests, uh, constantly regenerate those same requests, you have the proxy intelligently cache uh, those responses, such that for many future requests, the proper web server doesn't have to touch those requests at all. It doesn't have to see them at all. The reverse proxy itself can simply send back a cached response. Now, in the simplest possible setup with a web server, the web server is simply configured to read static files from the file system and then serve those files back as responses verbatim. Usually the way this works is that the web server is pointed to some particular directory, and then for each request, the web server interprets the path of the URL as a relative file path from that directory. So for example, if the path simply reads index.html, the web server will serve back the file called index.html in the directory to which our web server is configured to use. This assumes, of course, that the file exists. If it doesn't, then this is a bad request. Now, while this sort of configuration was fairly common in the early days of the web, today it's not really common at all. Almost all web servers these days are configured to take the incoming request, pass it along to another script, a, a separate program that is, and then that script, that program, that script then regenerates a response, which it hands back to the web server, and the web server then returns the actual HTTP response. To facilitate this pattern, a standard was developed specifying how exactly the web server and the script should communicate. And this standard is called CGI, which has nothing to do with computer-generated images. This stands for Common Gateway Interface. And how CGI works is really very simple. The web server, for every single request, it runs the script as a new separate process. So every request is a separate script process. When the web server runs a script, it passes to it the headers and get variables of the request in the environment, which recalls a feature of Unix processes. It's this data area in processes, which is handed down from one parent process to its child processes. And while this concept originates with Unix, it's also been imitated, say, on Windows and other operating systems. As for post requests, they include more than just a bunch of headers. There's also a body for the post and that gets passed to the script uh, via standard input. So the script reads the post body by reading its standard input, and then when the script generates a response, it writes it out to standard output, which the web server has configured to be a file which the web server itself can read. Usually this file is just a pipe, so the script writes to the pipe, and then the web server reads that same pipe to get the data. So that's all there is really to CGI, and it was the dominant mechanism for a number of years, but the problem is that it's inherently inefficient, mainly because of the overhead in launching a whole new process for every single request. To fix this problem, a couple alternatives to CGI were introduced, including one called Fast CGI. In Fast CGI, the server will keep a pool of script processes which it will keep reusing over and over for the requests that come in. So it doesn't have to constantly spawn new processes, it just keeps this pool of existing processes, like 10 or so, or whatever number is appropriate for your level of traffic. And because FastCGI maintains the same processes and, and constantly recycles them, it can't use the environment as a mechanism to pass data because that only works at the start of the process. Uh, the parent process, its environment gets inherited by the child, but once the child exists, the parent can't affect the environment anymore. So instead what FastCGI is that the web server simply sends the request data to the script process via a socket just an ordinary networking socket, and then the script will return the response over that same socket, which, frankly, is the more obvious thing to do. It's kind of strange that CGI didn't do that to begin with. Fast CGI has been one fairly popular solution to the problem of CGI's inefficiencies, but a more commonly used solution has been to simply take the interpreter for some commonly used scripting language, uh, like Python or Perl, and simply embed it in the web server itself. In the case of Apache, support for CGI, FastCGI, uh, and these embedded Perl and Python interpreters, they come in the form of Apache modules, because 
the Apache web server is actually written in a modular style where the core of the web server, the base of it, is very, very simple and with very few features. And then most of the features uh, you add in through optional use of modules. A number of these modules, like mod CGI, are official parts of the Apache web server project itself. So they come as separate modules, optional modules, but they're still part of the, uh, the same software project. Whereas some others, like say mod Python, those were originally created outside of the Apache project. Though in some cases these third-party modules become official modules, they get integrated into the uh, web server project. Now in the case of using Python with Apache, mod Python was the preferred means for a number of years, though in more recent years Python has developed a standard which it calls WSGI, which stands for Web Standard Gateway Interface, uh, which is not necessarily Python specific, though in practice it's mainly used uh, in Python. Basically, like CGI, it's another standard protocol for communication between the web server and the scripts that it invokes. I won't describe its details, but understand that now it's generally the preferred means for server-side programming with Python. And to use WSGI with Apache, we would use the module mod WSGI rather than mod Python. The term framework in programming essentially refers to a kind of library, but it's a library in which rather than you invoking a bunch of uh, functions and uh, instantiating classes provided by the library, uh, instead there's a bit of an inversion of that. You write code which is then itself invoked by the framework. So normally with a library we invoke the library code, but in a framework the framework invokes our code that we write or more accurately does a mix of the two. In a framework, there's also stuff which we invoke in our code that we write. So what's called a web application framework is a framework for writing web apps, for writing the scripts that are the server-side code run by a web server. When it comes to writing server-side scripts for a web server, there are a lot of common tasks, whatever our particular application is supposed to do. So it makes sense to use a web application framework to uh, handle all of that common work, that busy work for us, so we don't have to do it over and over again at each time. So what is the functionality provided by a web framework? Well, first off, there's abstraction over the request and the response. So say I'm in Python and I want to get the information about the current request, it's easiest and most convenient if I get that in the form of a Python object, rather than just a bunch of headers which I have to parse myself. It makes sense for the web framework to do that for me. Similarly, when I construct my response, it makes sense for the web framework to create the headers for me, because 99 times out of 100, I just want some usual defaults. A, another common feature for web frameworks is a feature for the preservation and tracking of session state. What is a session? Well, recall that HTTP itself is stateless. That is, each request is discrete from any other request. There's no uh, inherent mechanism in HTTP that knows that this request is coming from the same person who made that request. They're all independent. The idea of a session is that it's effectively the set of requests from a single user agent, a single browser. While HTTP itself has no notion of sessions, there are tricks we can use such that the web server can track uh, which requests are coming from the same user agent. The most common technique is to use cookies but uh, some user agents may have cookies disabled because some users are paranoid about their privacy. So failing that, there are some other techniques that uh, are clumsier, but they still work. So, so that, or just using cookies, is something the web framework can do for us. And then in our code that we write, we just get back this session state uh, all conveniently bundled for us as, say, just like a, a Python object, assuming we're using Python. And so if the web framework is tracking sessions, if it's keeping track of which requests are coming from which users, it then makes sense for the web framework to implement user authentication and authorization. Authentication being the process of determining that the user uh, is someone who they claim they are, and authorization being the process of granting access to some kind of resource to authenticated users. Authentication is about identifying users. Authorization is about granting privileges to identified users. Virtually all web frameworks also have a mechanism for templating, which refers to a mechanism by which we stub out the outline of a page and then programmatically insert values and things into uh, certain places on the page. If you go to most any website, you'll notice that every page has basically the same look and a lot of common elements like, say, uh, a, a navigation bar at the top and a logo at the top and a footer at the bottom. Well, those things are part of a template and then 
specific pages are generated by filling in a common template. URL mapping refers to the process by which the URLs of the incoming requests get mapped into some particular response. It's basically the scheme by which we interpret the URLs. Ultimately, what a particular path means for your site is totally under your control. It's up to the logic of your code. Frameworks typically include some conveniences that make uh, implementing that logic easier. Frameworks also typically include mechanisms for accessing a database, because in most websites there's some kind of user-generated information, whether that's users placing orders or users leaving comments. That kind of data is stuff that we store in a database, and so our server-side code needs to access a database. Many web frameworks also include some mechanisms that make it easier for you to keep your site secure, and most frameworks provide mechanisms for caching, which in some circumstances can significantly improve performance. Now, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of different web frameworks out there, but these five here represent what I would say are probably the five most popular for their respective languages. Uh, Zend, for example, is the most popular framework on PHP. Ruby on Rails is particularly notable because, first off, it's extremely dominant within Ruby. It's virtually the framework used in Ruby, and also it's highly influential. So say Django here for Python is actually heavily influenced by a lot of ideas from Ruby on Rails. You also see the influence of Rails in ASP, where there's almost now two different frameworks, or rather there's a framework within a framework. There's the normal, so to speak, ASP, and then more recently there's what's called ASP MVC. MVC here, here standing for Model View Controller, which is uh, the name of a particular architectural pattern, which uh, Ruby on Rails was one of the first to employ. And so ASP MVC is still, under the hood at least, uh, regular ASP, but uh, it abstracts over that with a uh, more modern, I would sort of say, uh, web framework. ASP is actually one of the older frameworks still around, and I've had some experience using regular ASP, and I did not care for it because it's quite heavy-handed and all uh, unnecessarily complicated, I would say. I much prefer the more modern, more Rails-like frameworks, like, say, Django, though I've heard good things about ASP MVC, so if you're programming in C Sharp or Visual Basic.net, I would strongly suggest looking to using ASP MVC over plain regular ASP. Now, what exactly is this architecture pattern called MVC? Well, MVC stands for Model, View, and Controller. And the idea simply is that we separate our application into three separate components. First, you have the controller, which in a sense orchestrates all things. And you have the view, which represents the presentational side of your application, like the generation of HTML. And then you have the model component, the model layer, which uh, represents the access to the database. So you put all the logic for data access and data storage in the model. You put the uh, HTML generation in, in the view layer, and then the controller, in a sense, uh, orchestrates that all and ties them together. Because, say, in a typical page on a, in a web application, we take data from the database and plug it into some view, some page template. And then the controller takes that generated response and actually returns it to the client. Now, when it comes to the details of how exactly then to structure or code, there are some competing interpretations of what this architecture means precisely, but in broad outline, it's very simple. You have the view representing the user interface, the model representing the data, and the controller, which bridges the gap, which orchestrates the use of the view and the model and combines them together into one, one end product. So MVC is the architectural pattern which most frameworks hem to, especially those which take after Ruby on Rails. It's almost impossible to talk about web frameworks in general, so we're going to cover a specific one in this unit called Web2Py, which is a framework for Python. Web2Py was created in 2007 by a guy named Massimo Di Piero, who created it originally for the purposes of teaching web programming in his university courses. From there, it grew into a proper full-fledged framework and is now developed and maintained by the creator Massimo himself, and an online community of developers, which is possible because it's released under an open source license, specifically the lesser GPL version 3. Web2Py is now my framework of choice, as I find the API is very well thought out, uh, the only downside to it being that it only supports Python 2 rather than Python 3. Web2Py certainly isn't alone among Python projects that have been very slow to adopt Python 3, 
but hopefully Python 3 support will show up uh, pretty soon, sometime in the next couple of years. A unique selling point of Web2Py is how easy it is to get up and running. In fact, you can just go to the website, choose the appropriate download for your platform, whether that's Linux, Mac, or Windows, and then unzip the download, and inside you'll find uh, an executable, run that executable, and then you'll see this prompt asking you to specify a server IP, a server port, and a password. The server IP has a default value 127.0.0.1, which is a local private IP address uh, just for your local host system. Uh, the server port is by default 8000, which is a sensible number. So unless there's some conflict with some other uh, server running on your system, 8000 should be fine. And, and then the password, uh, you can leave that blank, but you should fill it in. Otherwise, the uh, and some, some features are left disabled unless you have a password for security reasons. Certain features would be dangerous without a proper password on your server, so Web2Py will disable them if you don't provide a password. So, fill in a password, click Start. This will then start the built-in web server, which is included with Web2Py, called Rocket, which is not a web server you would use in, in, in a real production site. It, it serves its purpose here for um, demonstration purposes and just getting up and running and uh, playing around with Web2Py, but for a real website you would want to use Apache. Which, of course, you can do with Web2Py, but uh, we're not going to do it because that's a lot of distracting configuration stuff to go over. In any case, so Rocket, the built-in web server, is launched, running on the local host address 127.0.0.1 with port 8000. Once the server is running, which should only take a moment, uh, Web2Py will then automatically open your browser and take you to the URL 127.0.0.1 with on port 8000 with the path welcome slash default slash index, which is just the default example page when we launch Web2Py in this manner. Now, something somewhat unusual about Web2Py is that it has this concept of applications. In one running instance of Web2Py, whether it's using Apache as its web server or Rocket or whatever as its web server, that one instance of Web2Py potentially has multiple applications installed and running. And what an application is, is just a, sort of a logically separate site. I mean, normally you go to a domain name like yahoo.com and you think of it as just being one site. Um, but potentially, at least, uh, Web2Py allows you to develop separate applications and host them on the same domain. Nothing forces you to do this, of course. And in fact, in most professional web development, you know, you'll create a site for one domain name. And it's not really a usual thing to do to have multiple separate sites all under one domain name. So this multi-application paradigm is a bit strange, but it's handy if we need it. In any case, if you look in the directory where we have Web2Py installed, you'll find a subdirectory called Applications, and then in Applications we have subdirectories each named for the particular applications. So if I have an application named Foo, it'll be in a subdirectory of Applications called Foo. And then in each application directory we have a number of subdirectories, uh, most notably one called controllers, one called models, and one called views. So logically the way Web2Py is structured is that first again we have potentially more than one application in each install of Web2Py and then within each application uh, you have some number of controller modules and inside those controller modules you have one or more what Web2Py calls actions and an action really is just a function. What Web2Py calls a controller is just an ordinary module of Python code, and the actions contained within are just ordinary functions. The basic idea is that each incoming request gets processed by one particular action, and which action is specified by the URL of the request. And what Web2Py calls a controller is a little deviant from the term as it's used in MVC, a model view controller, because in Web2Py, a controller is simply just a model that contains some number of actions. It's almost more proper to think of the actions as really being the controllers in terms of the MVC architecture, but, but Web2Py simply chose to call them actions, and the controller modules are really just logical groupings of different actions. So if you have a number of related actions, it makes sense to place them together in one particular controller module. So given an incoming request, how does Web2Py decide which action to execute to process that request? Well, the pattern is simply that looking at the path of the URL, First is specified the name of the application, and then after a slash is specified the name of the controller module, and then after another slash is specified the name of the particular action function within that controller module. And after the action name we can put another slash, but that's just optional. It doesn't matter if we put one there or not. 
So this is the structure for URLs which Web2Py expects, though actually it will also accept URLs which only contain an application and a controller, or just an application, or actually nothing, like say just an empty path. And what's going on here is that if you leave out the action, then Web2Py assumes the default action name, index, and if the controller is left off as well, Web2Py assumes the default controller, which is itself called default. And finally, the application, if you leave that off, Web2Py assumes the application which has been configured as the default. In Web2Py's configuration files, you can specify that I want this application to be the so-called default application. So looking back at the example page which Web2Py first presented to us, you can see the path in the URL is welcome slash default slash index. So this is the page returned by the action named index in the controller module named default in the application named welcome. The welcome application is simply an example Web2Py application that's included with the Web2Py download, so it's there by default, and initially it's configured as the default application. So here, if we enter the URL 127.0.0.1 colon 8000 slash with no path, just a slash, it would take us actually to the same page because welcome is the default application, the default controller name is called default, and the default action is called index. Another Web2Py application that comes installed with Web2Py is a special one called admin. If you navigate to admin slash default slash site, you'll see this page, though actually it will first prompt you for a password because uh, you don't want anyone to access your admin page, you only want yourself to be able to access it or people with, who are authorized. Because in this admin application, we can do anything we want to our install of Web2Py. We can, we can install and remove applications, and actually we can go in and edit the code of any of the applications. There's a web interface provided here for looking at the code and actually editing it. This web interface for modifying your code is actually a unique feature of Web2Py. You, you of course don't have to use it. You can edit your code like you normally would with a text editor, but it's kind of handy that this thing exists. For one, say you're not on your development machine where you don't have your code. Um, if you can log in remotely to the admin application, you can then uh, effectively change your code from anywhere you have web access. Arguably though, the admin application then represents a pretty damn huge security hole. If, if your admin gets compromised, then people can do whatever they want, and you'd really be totally compromised. So you can, if you choose, disable this admin application. The thing you can't do though, however, is actually remove, uninstall the admin application. That's why, if you look at the screen here, the admin application is listed with a little lock icon indicating that you can't either edit this application or delete it because it's a special application. The other applications you'll see included by default, the welcome application, which we already discussed, and the examples application, those are just regular applications, so you can uninstall them if you choose. The examples application is very strangely named because it's actually the, the code that runs the Web2Py site itself, the web2py.org website. Despite the name examples, though, it doesn't really include examples. I would say Welcome actually makes a better example application. In any case, if you look over on the right, you'll see where it says New Simple Application, and we fill in the name of an application we want to create, and then hit the Create button. So I'll do that. I enter the name Thing and hit Create. That will create an application named Thing and take me to the admin page on which I can edit this application. You'll see at the top here, it lists the name of the module files which constitute our models, first db.py and menu.py, and then you can see we have two controller modules, there's default.py and appadmin.py, and underneath that in the view section, it lists the content of the views directory in our application, which we'll talk more about later. So again, while you can use this page in the admin application to edit your other applications, uh, you don't have to. Um, it's a little clunky, to, to be honest. Uh, just the nature of the web browser is not all that ideal for editing code, but it is a neat feature to have in some circumstances. I would just go into the actual application directory, find the files I want to edit, open them in a text editor, and, and do it that way. So now that we've created this application thing, if we navigate to the URL with the path thing slash default slash index, uh, we will see this page, and lo and behold, it looks exactly like the page in the welcome application, except it says thing instead of welcome. The reason for this is that when we create a new application, Web2Py simply takes the welcome application as basically a template, simply making a copy of all that and swapping the name of the application to whatever you chose. 
So with our new applications, we start off with some basic functionality already functioning, like the ability to create a user account for application and then log in. Um, and also it provides a general template for the pages. Now, if we don't like any of that, we can strip it out. So we're not beholden to this. It's very easy to get rid of, but it's kind of nice to start with more than just a blank page. Now here in my editor of choice, I've opened the controller module called default, which is the file default.py in the directory controllers. In our new application, default.py doesn't start off life totally empty. It has a few actions in it, including, uh, very importantly, index. In the case of the index action, that's one you can edit as you see fit. A couple of the others, though, you shouldn't edit or remove for reasons we'll discuss uh, much later. For clarity, though, we should start with a blank slate, so let's create our own separate controller module, which we'll call ground control. So in the controllers directory, we create a file called groundcontrol.py, and we'll open up the file and create one simple action, which we'll call major tom. The function major tom note takes no parameters, and all it does is return a single string, hello world. So making sure to save the groundcontrol.py file, uh, we then go to our browser and navigate to thing slash ground control slash major tom. So the action major tom inside the controller module named ground control inside the application named thing. And what do we see? Well, the page just has hello world. It just has that text we returned as a string. And in the browser, if we look at the page source, you'll see that this actually isn't really HTML. There's no HTML tag with no header tag and body tag. It's just the text hello world. So when we return a string from an action, what's returned in the body of the response is just that text verbatim. It doesn't even have to be HTML. And most browsers will then render that as a page as best it can, which in this case just means rendering it as plain text. Now let's go back to the ground control module and add in a second function, which we'll call action man. This time though, we'll give the function a parameter, x. Again, making sure we save the groundcontrol.py module file once we've finished editing it. If we now go back to the browser and enter a URL with the path thing slash groundcontrol slash action man, Web2Py will give us a response with this error message because the function action man is actually not a proper action. It doesn't constitute as an action because it has a parameter. Web2Py expects action functions to not have any parameters. So only the functions you define without parameters in the controller modules, only those are actions. Any other function you define with a parameter, it's not an action. Come to think of it, hopefully I haven't confused you by putting action in the name of the function, which isn't an action. Now, as you saw, our action major tom returned a string. And when an action returns a string, the response that comes back is just that string verbatim. Uh, when an action returns a dictionary, however, what Web2Py will then do is generate a response from a view of the same name as the action. And views, as we'll see, are special modules located in the views directory of our application. So given a path application name slash controller name slash action name, if the action run returns a dictionary, then the response will be generated by the corresponding view file with the same name, though actually ending in the extension .html. However, if in the URL path a different extension is appended to the name of the action, then the corresponding view will be that with the same name ending in that specified extension. So here we list some examples. If the URL reads thing slash ground control slash major tom, well, that doesn't have any extension specified, so the default extension is .html. So assuming that the processing action returns a dictionary, the response will be rendered by the file found in thing, the application directory, uh, slash views, slash ground control, slash major tom dot html. Likewise, if the URL is the same but ends in the extension dot html, the same view file will still be used to render the response. However, if the extension is something else, like say dot xml, then the view file should be the one named majortom.xml, and if it's .json, it should be majortom.json. Or if the URL extension is RSS, then it's the view file named majortom.rss. Now, these view files, whether they end in .html or .xml or .json or .rss, 
the contents of these files aren't really what the extension implies. Uh, a view file ending in .html does not contain straight HTML. It's actually the uh, templating language uh, used by Web2Py. So it's, a, it's actually a mix of HTML and uh, Python code. And the idea is that from this HTML and this Python code, an HTML response is generated. That's why the view ends in .html, because the end product is supposed to be HTML. Likewise, for a view ending in JSON, the view file itself likely doesn't contain just JSON. It includes a mix of Python code, uh, but from that JSON and Python code, a JSON response is generated. How exactly views generate responses is something we'll get to a bit later. So now, let's sum up the story so far. First off, a request comes in, it specifies some URL path, Web2Py parses the URL to determine which action in which controller in which application does it want to process this request. What happens then is that the controller module, the entirety of it, not just the action function, is run, it's executed. And in the course of the execution, that's when the function gets defined, that we then have our function object, which we can invoke, so the action is invoked. And when it returns a dictionary, uh, that dictionary gets passed to the appropriate view, the, the view of the corresponding name to the action. Uh, the view then generates a response, and this is the body of the HTTP response which Web2Py passes along to the web server, and the web server sends it back to the user agent. For the sake of convenience, Web2Py defines a type which it calls storage. The storage class is defined in a module called storage inside a package called Gluon. Uh, I don't know where the name Gluon comes from, but it's the name that Web2Py gives to its uh, library that contains all the core elements. In any case, what a storage object is, is basically a more convenient dictionary. More convenient in the sense that you can use the attribute operator, the dot operator, to access key value pairs, rather than having to use the subscript operator, the uh, square brackets. So here we create a new storage object and assign it to the reference S. The storage starts out empty, it doesn't have any key value pairs, but then we write s.foo equals 3, and this creates a key value pair with a key of the string reading foo and a value of 3. If we then write s.foo equals none, this is actually the same as removing the key value pair. So we're not changing the value of the string key foo to the value none, we're just actually getting rid of the whole key value pair. And in the next line we write s.bar and that returns none. So the expression s.bar, assuming there is no key of that name, will return none rather than what a dictionary does, which is throw an exception. Uh, again, the idea of storage objects is simply that they're like a dictionary, and just more convenient. As we'll see later, a number of important types in Web2Py are derived from storage. So with those objects, you can assign to them and retrieve from them attributes of any name, whether the object has an attribute already of that name or not. Unlike with a dictionary, you don't have to worry too much about accessing a name that isn't in the collection, because that will just return none rather than throw an exception. Now, when it comes to the modules which we create in our applications, whether we're talking about the controller modules, or the model modules, or the view modules, uh, which we haven't discussed yet, um, in all those cases, Web2Py does not simply import them as one normally does when one wants to run a uh, Python module. Instead, what Web2Py will do is it uses an exec statement, which is a kind of statement that existed in Python 2, but actually has been removed from Python 3. Uh, and also it uses a built-in function called exec file. And both exec statements and the exec file function, what they do is quite similar with slight variance. But the gist of what they both do is take some Python code, whether it's in the form of a string or the form of some file, and it executes that code which sounds quite similar to what import does, except in this case it doesn't create a module object. And unlike what happens when importing modules, the code will be run no matter what, whereas with modules, if the module has previously already been run, it won't run again. So that right there partly explains why Web2Py uses exec and exec file rather than import statements. The other reason being that Web2Py wants to magically inject into the namespace of the module certain variables. For example, in our controller modules, we want to have available certain objects, but we don't want to have to import anything. We want Web2Py to put those names into our, our module namespace automatically. And Web2Py can only do this using exec and exec file rather than import. Two of the most important objects which Web2Py automatically makes available in your controller modules 
is uh, request and response. Request being an instance of gluon.globals.request and response being an instance of gluon.globals.response. Uh, notice that these are classes defined in a module called globals because these are names which are globally made available throughout your application by the means we just discussed. As these names suggest, the request object encapsulates the currently processing request and the response object encapsulates the response to that request. And both the request type and the response type are descendants of storage, so we can access and create attributes for these objects simply using the attribute operator, the dot operator. A third important object is session, which is an instance of the class session found also in the module gluon.globals. Like request and response, session is a descendant of storage, and the purpose of the session object is that it can retain values between different requests. Remember that the HTTP protocol itself is perfectly stateless, so various different requests all coming from the same user agent, nothing inherent in HTTP tells the server that, hey, these are all coming from the same browser. The workaround for this is to use a cookie. When the user makes a first request to our site, our site sends back a cookie for their browser to store with a unique identifier number, and then subsequently, in any request uh, back to our server, the browser will automatically include that cookie value, so we can identify that, hey, this is another request from that same person. And so part of the convenience of Web2Py is that it's managing this cookie for us, and with each unique user, it is associating a session object. So we can store values in the session object, and the next time we get a request from the same user, then those values are all retained in the session object. So, for example, if in the course of processing a request, we set the attribute foo of the session object to the value 2, well, in any subsequent request from the same user, the same browser, the session object will have that value for its attribute foo, unless, of course, we choose to remove it by assigning none to that attribute. So, the session object is a convenient way for retaining values between different requests from the same user. Be clear, though, that session objects aren't really intended for long-term storage. If you have a lot of data you want to keep about a user, uh, you don't store that in the session object, you store it in the database. You create a table with your users, and you have the user log in, and that's where you keep their user data. The session object is intended more for transient data. Looking at the request object, one of its most important attributes is called env, short for environment, as in the environment, which is so cold because in CGI at least, the environment is the means by which the headers are passed from the web server to the script. So this env attribute, this environment attribute, is itself another storage object containing all the so-called environment variables passed from the web server to web2py. So for example, request.env.pathinfo will contain the path of the URL and request.env.request method will specify whether this is a get request or a post request. You'll also see a good number of attributes beginning with HTTP underscore, and these are all the, the raw headers in the request. So HTTP underscore host here, that's the host header, and it had the value 127.0.0.1 colon 8000. Now, and the important thing to understand about request.env is that its contents are not entirely up to Web2Py. It depends upon what the web server chooses to send to, to the script. And not all web servers send all the same information. And in a couple cases, they might send the, the same information as another web server, but call it something different. So what you get exactly in request.env depends upon the web server. Although, for the most part, there is uniformity, especially when it comes to the most important things you'll find in Invent, like, say, uh, HTTP host. That should be included no matter what web server you're, you're using. Just be mindful that some things in here may be web server specific. So, you can think of request.env as, in a sense, being the raw, unparsed information coming from the web server. Most of the other attributes of the request object are just more convenient forms of accessing that same information. So, for example, request.cookies contains the cookies sent with the request, but here they're presented as uh, cookie objects. In, in the Python library, there's a module called cookie with a class called simple cookie, which, despite the name, actually can represent multiple cookies rather than just one. So, request.cookies is a simple cookie object. 
the attributes request.now and request.utc now, they both contain uh, Python date time objects representing the time, the time and date of the request. The only difference being that now is localized for your time zone and UTC now is expressed in terms of UTC time, which in English is known as coordinated universal time, which is basically Greenwich Mean Time, though not exactly the same to my understanding. The attribute request.userAgent actually contains a function which takes the uh, user agent header in the request and parses it and returns a dictionary representing information about the user agent, like say, what operating system, what's the name of the browser engine, uh, that sort of stuff. And the reason this comes in the form of a function rather than a dictionary is because in most requests you're not going to want to check the user agent, and parsing that user agent string can be slightly costly, so it, it kind of makes sense for the sake of efficiency to not bother. So when you do need it, you have to call the function and that gets you the dictionary. The attribute request.ajax is simply a boolean indicating whether or not this is an ajax request or not. Uh, whether something is an ajax request can't always be determined, but usually when the browser makes an ajax request, it will include a request header called uh, x-requested-with and the value uh, xml http request. So assuming that's done, we can tell whether a request was made as an ajax request. The request attributes application controller function and extension, unsurprisingly, contain the application controller function and extension, respectively. To get this information, Web2Py itself, of course, has to parse the request URL. Though, actually, as we discussed, the URL may leave out some or all of this information, and it may just simply be inferred. Like, for example, if we don't specify any extension, then the extension.html is assumed. Also note here the oddity that the proper term action is not being used, instead for some reason they called it function. I, I assume that's just a mistake and they simply haven't corrected it. So just try and remember that it's request.function rather than request.action as you would expect. Lastly, probably the most important request attributes are these. Get vars, as in get variables, contains the name value pairs passed as get parameters, and post vars as in post variables, contains the name value pairs parsed from the post body, assuming this was a post request, otherwise it'll be blank. And both of these are storage objects. So say if the URL contains a get parameter named foo with a value of three, you'll find an attribute uh, foo in the get vars object with the value three. The vars attribute, again short for variables, is another storage object, but this is an amalgamation of the get vars and the post vars together. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happens when there's a name collision. I believe the post variables clobber the get variables. So if you have a post variable named foo and a get variable also named foo, in, in vars it'll contain just the post variable foo, not the get variable. Uh, I'm not certain about that. I, I wouldn't say it's a huge issue because name collisions between post variables and get variables isn't really very common. In any case, the vars attribute isn't strictly necessary, it's just more convenient to use in some circumstances. The args attribute, short for arguments, is a list of zero or more strings. What Web2Py calls an argument is a slash separated token appended to the end of the URL after the action. So given these three examples, the first one has a single argument Sam, the second one has two arguments, first Sam, then Alice, and the third one has three arguments Sam, Alice, and then Bob. And again, note that after the arguments, you can optionally put a slash there or, or not. It doesn't matter to Web2Py. So any so-called args in a URL, Web2Py puts them in a list in order, which it assigns to request.args. And understand that for any URL, we can tack onto the end get parameters, which Web2Py somewhat confusingly calls vars, even though these are just the get vars, not the post vars. But in any case, we have three more examples here. The first with a single get parameter, a single var, uh, with the name Edgar and the value Sharon. The second example has two vars, two get vars, first uh, name Edgar with the value Sharon again, and then uh, separated by an ampersand, of course, is uh, the name Aubrey with the value Lisa. And finally, this last example here includes both args and vars. There's a single arg, Bob and then two vars again, Edgar with the value Sharon and Aubrey with the value Lisa. And be clear that vars, unlike args, don't have any concept of order. So if you write Aubrey before Edgar, it would still be the same URL. Now, if you're like me, you'll have trouble remembering which are args and which are vars, because frankly it's kind of arbitrary. 
without any context, these terms are really almost synonyms, so it's kind of arbitrary which is called which. The way I finally remembered is that A alphabetically comes before V, so args come before vars. The last attribute we'll discuss in request is called body, and it contains a read-only file which represents the content of the request body, uh, which of course only exists if this is a post request. And while normally we don't have much cause to use request.body because uh, Web2Py itself will parse the content as uh, name value pairs and place those in the post vars attribute, well, sometimes the request body doesn't come in the form of uh, name value pairs. Sometimes the body is just, say, a bunch of XML or a bunch of binary data. And in those cases, the post vars attribute is going to be empty, so you have to read the body yourself. Now, as for the response object, we have a different set of attributes, starting with response.headers, which is a dictionary simply containing all the headers included in the response. And of course, many of these are automatically set by Web2Py, but then if you want to add your own headers or modify one of the headers, uh, you can do so via this attribute. Uh, and then the attribute response.cookies contains a simple cookie object, which represents the cookies being set in the response. The attribute status contains the HTTP response code being sent back, which of course by default will be 200 with the message OK. If you want to send a different response code, rather than set this attribute directly, uh, you should raise an HTTP exception, which is a exception included in Web2Py we'll talk about later. The view attribute contains the view that will be used to render the response once the action returns. If you modify this before the uh, action returns, then that'll actually change which view gets used. Otherwise, this is set by default to the, to the view of the same name as the action, as we discussed earlier. And last here, the render attribute is actually a function which takes two arguments, the path to a view file, and then the parameter vars expects a dictionary. And what the render function does is it manually invokes a view and whatever that view generates is not immediately returned as the response, but rather just returned by this function as a string. So whereas most commonly views are invoked automatically when an action returns, in this case we're just manually invoking a, a view and getting this generated content. And the role of the dictionary passed to vars is the same as the dictionary returned by an action. The names in the dictionary become variables accessible in the view. Lastly, the most important attribute of the response object is write, which contains a method that actually writes data to the response body. Write normally takes a string argument, which is the data that gets written to the response body, and it optionally takes a second argument, a named argument, escape, with a Boolean value, either true or false. When escape is false, the content of the string is written verbatim, but when escape is true, the text is XML escaped as we say, meaning the text is treated as if it's supposed to be the content of an XML or HTML tag. And so characters like the less than sign, the greater than sign, ampersands, those have to be converted into what XML and HTML call character entities. For example, the less than sign is escaped as ampersand LT semicolon. These character entities are then of course rendered in the browser as the characters which they represent, but this way the browser doesn't confuse them as the angle brackets of a tag. So here we have two examples of invoking response.write with the same string argument, but in one escape is false and in the other escape is true. As you can see, when escape is false, the text is written into the response body verbatim, whereas when escape is true, those angle brackets all become character entities. A view module is expressed in Web2Py's special template syntax, and by a few simple rules, Web2Py will take that view file and translate it into a module of ordinary Python code. So first off, any text in a view which is inside a pair of double braces, that is taken as verbatim Python code. It's one or more lines of Python code. However, there's an exception whereby if the first character inside the double braces is an equal sign, then the text that follows should be a single Python expression, and these double curly braces are translated into a single line of response.write with expression as the first argument and the escape argument given the value true. As for all the text outside of double curly braces, each contiguous chunk between the pairs of curly braces is translated into the single line of Python response.write 
with the chunk of text as the string argument to write and escape set to false. In other words, that whole chunk of text is going to be written out to the response body verbatim without escaping. Lastly, to make up for the fact that in this templating syntax, we're not observing the normal rules of Python indentation, we have to make sure that every block of Python code, every if block, every else block, etc., has a logical terminator. Therefore, every block has to end with either a return, raise, or pass statement. The pass statement, recall, is a special Python statement that does nothing. So, most commonly, you'll just put a pass statement at the end of, say, your if blocks to indicate. This here indicates the end of this if. So, with these four rules in mind, say we have a view file with this content. When this gets translated into Python, all of the chunks of text outside the pairs of double curly braces becomes a single line of Python code that invokes response.write with that text as the argument, and the text inside each pair of curly braces gets taken verbatim as one or more lines of Python code. So on first pass, this is what we end up with, but notice this isn't yet proper Python because it doesn't have Pythonic indentation. Because, however, we included the pass statement to indicate the termination of the if-else block, Web2Py can infer the indentation. And so this is the end result. Notice that without the pass statement here, Web2Py wouldn't know whether or not the last response.write line, whether that's supposed to be part of the else block or not. If we didn't include this pass statement, the view would be no good because the code would be ambiguous and Web2Py would give us an error. Now, this is something I mentioned only in passing, so it's good to state here again, and that is that in a view module, Web2Py automatically imports into that view module's namespace first every key value pair that was returned by the action, uh, like say, if the action returns a dictionary with a key of the string foo and the value three, that's gonna become a variable foo with a value three in the view. And the view doesn't have to import anything because it's just there by magic. Because as we described earlier, Web2Py doesn't import modules normally. It uses the special exec statement and the built-in function exec file. And aside from that dictionary, views also have access to all of the things that were defined in the model modules, which we haven't discussed yet, but any name we assign in those modules, we can access that stuff in our views if we like. In other words, the module namespace of those model modules is visible inside any view. The view temple syntax is slightly more complicated than I let on because it also contains what are called directives. There's just a handful of these and they're written inside double curly braces, but they're not lines of Python code that begin with uh, the word include or the word extend. When you see the include directive written with a file path in quote marks, uh, that is a standalone directive that just works by itself. Whereas if you see an include directive without any file path, that's used in conjunction with the other directive called extend. So first off, here's what the include directive does when we specify a file path. We have two separate view files here, the first mypage.html and the other called otherview.html. And in the mypage view, there's an include directive which specifies a file path pointing to the other view file. And note that it's a relative path relative from the views directory. The effect of this include directive when we render mypage.html, the content of the other view which we're pointing to, otherview.html, that gets inserted in place. So the content of otherview.html is inserted in place of where the include directive was. Now with this form of the include directive, it makes sense that you can include in your view multiple include directives. When it comes to the other include directive, the include form that doesn't have any uh, file specified, that form is used in conjunction with extend, and include and extend you would only include once. The way that the fileless form of include and the extend directive work together is that in one view, the view that we're going to render, here mypage.html, we use an extend directive and we have it specify the path to the other view file, here mastertemplate.html, which is directly in the views directory and in the master template.html view, we place a single include directive with no file specified. What happens then when we render mypage.html, which contains the extend directive, is the other template specified in the extend directive here, master template.html, the content above its include directive gets inserted in place where the extend directive was, and the content below the include directive gets appended to the end. And be absolutely clear here, we're talking about modifying the rendered output, not modifying the actual view files. 
Now, the way I just explained this is how I prefer to think of how extend and include work together. The other way to think of it, though, is that it works in the opposite direction, where the content of my page, the stuff above the extend, is being inserted at the top in the other template, and the stuff below extend is being inserted where include goes. But whichever way you think of it, the rendered output comes out the same. Now, the intended purpose of extend and include is that we can create a template file in which we place the include directory, and then we can create various other views which all extend that one template. So, most commonly for a site, you create a template file that defines the header and the footer that you want to see on every single page, and also includes default style stuff like uh, defining the margins on the sides and, and so forth, and defining what the background should look like. And then, where you have the include directive, that's the content area where you plug in the specific content for specific pages. So, in the views for our specific pages, we place the stuff we want to get inserted there below the extend directive. The purpose of allowing stuff to go above the extend directive and thereby remain at the top of the rendered output, the intended use of that is mainly not to put actual content, you know, text content that's going to be in the final output, but rather to put lines of Python code which define things of certain names. That way we can have a master template that makes use of variable names which the template expects to have provided by the specific page which is extending the template. So say if the template file makes use of some function named foo, which it itself does not define, well what's going on there is it's expecting the extending view to define a function foo above the extend directive. That way the function foo will exist before it gets called. So the template view made use of something which it left up to the extending view to define. That way the different extending views can define it in different ways. As another convenience, Web2Py provides what it calls HTML helper types. These are essentially Python classes which represent the various elements that make up an HTML document. Each class represents a different kind of HTML tag. So there's the type A, capital A, for an anchor tag, P for a paragraph tag, div for a div tag, span for span, form for a form, input it for an input, etc., including basically all the commonly used HTML tags. So, here are a few examples. First, we're creating an object representing an anchor tag, and the content of that tag is passed as the first argument as a string, and then any attributes to the tag are passed as named arguments, but notice the named argument starts with an underscore, so to set the href, we, we have a named argument underscore href. So, this invocation of the A class returns a new object representing an anchor with an href of http colon slash slash yahoo.com, and the text content, a search engine. So the common pattern with these helper types is that the positional arguments we pass to them, those become the content to the tag, and if we want to set any attributes, we pass those as named arguments with an underscore at the start. So here in the second example, we're creating a div object, and we're passing to it three positional arguments, two of which are other helper objects. They are p tag objects, paragraph tags. And so what we end up with is a div with the content of first a p tag containing the text blah blah because that's what was passed to the first p tag. Uh, and then the text content hello and then another p tag also with text content reading blah blah. Now an important thing to understand here is a string argument is treated as text content so it is effectively XML escaped. Here when you create a div and pass in a single string containing what looks like a tag but no these uh, angle brackets, the less than and greater than signs, uh, they get XML escaped into character entities. Now, usually what we do with these helper objects is we ultimately render them back into text when we use them in a view. And this is done with the method, which is rather strangely named XML. So here, for example, when we invoke the XML method on this div helper object, what we get back is a string reading div p blah blah np and div which is what you would expect because that's the HTML represented by this object. And again, be clear that the strings we pass to these helper object constructors, they're always treated as text content that needs to be XML escaped. So here when we pass to div this string that looks like it contains a p tag, well, no, that's not parsed into, into a p tag, it's just treated as text content. So when we invoke the XML method on this div object, the string we get back, yes, there's the div tag, but then inside are a bunch of character entities where the angle brackets were. There's another useful helper object which does not represent an HTML tag, but rather just represents actually 
any text we want, any text that we don't want to get XML escaped. And kind of strangely, this helper type is called XML because, well, it is useful for representing XML, but it's also useful for representing any other text, like, say, maybe JavaScript code. But here, for example, we're creating an XML object, and its content actually is proper XML, and notice that it's not getting escaped. So when we call the XML method on this XML helper object, what we get back is a string with the verbatim content. Now, you're probably wondering, well, why does this thing exist? Because all it's doing is wrapping a string, and then when we call the main method of this object, XML, we're just getting that string back, so what's the point? Well, the XML type has optional features we can use to sanitize the text. To be sure, for example, that the text it encompasses parses as proper XML. So that's kind of why this helper is called XML, even though it isn't necessarily always used to contain XML. Now, you're likely still skeptical about the usefulness of these helper objects. Uh, what point is it to create div objects and p objects and anchor objects? Why not just express those things directly as text in the views? Well, that's what we normally do, but sometimes, say, in the course of our model modules or our controllers, we want to programmatically put together some HTML. And when we do that, it makes a lot of sense to have these helper objects rather than having to ourselves parse and concatenate a bunch of strings, which is both bothersome to do and error prone. So just generally, when you're in the mode of Python, you don't want to have to dip into some other language, some other syntax like HTML. You want to work directly in Python syntax and Python semantics. Another justification for these HTML helpers is that in some cases, like with form, these helper objects provide some extra intelligent behavior. Form is the best example of this, so consider this here where we're creating a form and we're giving the form two inputs. The first input has the attribute type with the value text and the name with the value my text, and then the second input has just a single attribute type submit. When we then get the HTML string from this form object using the XML method, this is what we get. We have a form with two input tags, and the inputs have the attributes we specified, but notice that the form is automatically given certain default attributes, such as ang type as an encode type with the value multipart slash form data, which specifies how the form data gets encoded when the form is posted. Now, of course, I can change these default attributes if I like, but these at least are sensible defaults. So far, this isn't much added extra convenience, but form objects also have a method called accepts. To the accepts method, we first pass the vars, that is the get parameters and the post parameters of the request. Then we pass the session object, and optionally, we specify with the named argument form name a name for this form. And the first important thing which the accepts method does is to insert two hidden input tags the first one named underscore form key and the other one named underscore form name. The form name attribute, you can see, is given the value of whatever we pass to form name, which in this case is Teresa, but if we don't specify any form name, the value here will just be default. Uh, the, the purpose of the form name is to uniquely identify the form within the page. So in cases where you have more than one form, you're going to want to specify a form name. Otherwise, you'll get a name collision because multiple forms will have the same name default and Web2Py won't be able to distinguish between them. The other added input, form key, is given a randomly generated value. And this value is different each time the form is generated. So in one request, it's going to be a different value than in any other request. And this generated value is preserved in the session such that when the form is then submitted and sent back to the same page, Web2Py can check and see if the form is a double submission, if this is just a repeat of the same form being submitted which happens sometimes in some browsers because you, you click the submit button and then you cancel and then you click submit again and that ends up posting the same form twice, which could be bad because it might screw up the logic of your application. Now, the reason the method is called accepts is because aside from generating these two hidden inputs, it also checks the request for us to see if the values for this form are being submitted in the current request because usually we design our forms to submit back to the same page. So the first time a user goes to a page with a form on it, the form is blank, they fill in the information, they hit submit, and then the data is sent to the same URL as they were already on. So the accepts method checks the request vars to see if this is the form being submitted, or if it's just the first time the form is being created and given to the user. 
if the accepts method determines that the form data is being submitted and that this is not a double submission, which it determines by checking the form key value in the session, then the accepts method will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. So a very common idiom in Web2Py is when we have a page with a form, first in the action, we create the form using our form helper, and then we call on that form the accepts method uh, passing to it the request for us and the session and optionally a name. And if that accepts method returns true, then form data has been submitted and we process that submitted form data. If accepts returns false, however, then there's no data to process. And notice in the action, we're going to return a dictionary with the form included because we want to pass the form object because in the view, we're going to render the form with response.write which reminds me of another important point about the HTML helpers and the XML helper. And that is that when you pass them as argument to response.write instead of a string, the write method will get their content as text data using the XML method. And the named argument escape, whether it's true or false, has no effect. So remember that the text in HTML helpers is always escaped. And in the XML helper, it's never escaped. So if you pass an HTML helper to response.write, then effectively it's always escaped, and if you pass an XML helper to response.write, then it's never escaped. One more important convenience is the function URL, which returns a URL in the form of the string. And despite the fact that the name is in all caps, don't think that this is really a helper. It's not a class, it's just a function that returns a string. The way URL works when we pass to it three string arguments is that the first is the name of the application, the second is the controller, and the third is the action. And that returns the URL you expect pointing to that action in that controller in that application. If we provide just two string arguments, then this is interpreted as first the controller and the action, and the application is inferred from whatever the application of the current request is. And likewise, if we just provide one argument, this is interpreted as just the action. And so both the application and the controller are inferred from whatever the current application and controller are for the current request. Now, optionally, you can also include args and vars, and args are supplied in the form of a list because args have a concept of order, but vars are provided as a dictionary because vars don't have any order and they come as key value pairs. Now, by default, URL will return a relative URL, a URL which only works from the context of whatever page uh, we're currently generating in the current request. If you want to force URL to return an absolute URL, which is occasionally useful, you specify the optional named argument host with the value true. I guess it's called host because we're explicitly including the host in the output URL. Now, the question is, why do you need to use this URL function rather than just write out URLs yourself? Well, generally speaking, you're going to want to use the URL function as much as possible because it will spare you from having all your links break in your application if you ever apply or modify the URL rewriting rules for your application, which is a feature we'll talk about in the supplement. Normally, Web2Py will return a response with the status code 200 and the message OK, which is the normal kind of successful HTTP response. If, however, in the course of processing a request, an exception gets raised and that exception doesn't get handled, Web2Py will then send a response with an error page and an error status code. Now, if an error gets raised which your code doesn't anticipate, well, that's a bug. If, however, you wish to send a response which is something other than a status 200 code, you can do so by raising an exception type provided by Web2Py called HTTP, all in caps. The HTTP exception constructor expects two main arguments. First, the code itself, expressed as an integer. And secondly, some string, which will serve as the body of the response. And optionally, you can include named arguments, which will become additional headers in the response. So the first example here will return a response with the status code 401, which is an error code and the message in the body will be the string don't go there. And in the second example, it's a 303, which is a kind of redirect, and the body says go here instead, and we're including a location header with the value http colon slash slash yahoo.com, because for a redirect, you want to include that header so the browser knows where it's supposed to redirect to. Understand that the usual behavior of web browsers when they receive a redirect code, like 303, 
is to actually then go to the specified URL. So raising this HTTP exception with status code 303 and a header specifying a location of yahoo.com, well, that should redirect the browser to yahoo.com. Because code 303 is the status code that you want to return most often, aside from 200, of course, Web2Pi provides a more succinct function to do the same thing. So here, this last example, where we invoke redirect and pass in just a URL, but that's equivalent to the line above, where we raised uh, HTTP with the status code of 303. The only difference for redirect is that we don't specify any response body because, well, with the redirect, the response body doesn't really matter anyway. The user's not going to see it, they're going to be redirected to some other page. Now, the last thing to understand about this HTTP exception is that, unlike other exceptions that get thrown and trigger uh, an error page to be sent back as a response, this HTTP exception will not cause any open database connections to roll back. So if you have any open database connections, when you raise an HTTP exception, the transactions for those connections will commit rather than roll back. So if you do want them to roll back, you should actually do that explicitly before raising this HTTP exception. Now, speaking of databases, we can finally talk about model modules. Earlier, when we laid out the whole life cycle of how Web2Pi handles a single request, we skipped over one step. And that is that before the controller module is executed, the model modules of the application are executed. So what purpose are model modules supposed to serve? Well, mainly their purpose is to be the place where we put the code that defines the database schema and opens any database connections we need. That's why they're called the models, because in MVC architecture, the model is the area concerning everything to do with the data of the application, the data persistence and storage. In Web2Pi, though, these models tend to be also the place where we set any configuration variables our application might use. And the reason we glob that stuff together with the database stuff is, well, it's just convenient. And that's because any name which we define in these model modules, any name you create in the namespace, if you define a function or if you assign to a variable, Web2Pi takes those names and automatically imports them into your controller module and also into the views that get executed. So, for example, when we open a database connection, we typically assign the object representing that connection to a variable, which we usually call db, and then in our controller module, we can simply refer to db, and it's, it's just there implicitly, because Web2Pi makes sure that anything that you defined in your model module is going to get carried over. And in cases where more than one model module gets executed, then all the stuff defined in the earlier modules will be available in all of the later modules. So if I have model module A and model module B, and A runs first, well then anything we defined in A will be accessible in B, and we don't have to explicitly import anything. Web2Pi makes it happen automatically by the means that we discussed earlier, where it'll execute models using the exec statement and the exec file function rather than use the usual import statement. So to sum up this automatic importing business that Web2Pi does, first the model modules run, and everything you define in one of those modules is visible in every module that runs subsequently thereafter. And then after the model modules, uh, the controller and then the view modules execute. And while everything from the models is visible in both the controller and the view, the definitions in the controller module are not carried over automatically into the view. The only way things pass from the controller to the view is when you put them in the dictionary, which you return from the action function. Now the question that remains is, for a particular request, which model modules are going to run? Well, first off, all the model modules are included in the uh, models subdirectory of your application directory, and all the modules directly in that directory are always run for every request. However, any modules placed in a subdirectory of the models directory only the directory with the name matching that of the controller and the action of the request, only the modules of that one subdirectory of the models directory get executed. So, for example, the modules in the subdirectory models slash foo slash bar, those only get executed in a request where the controller is foo and the action is bar. Similarly, any modules found in just models slash foo, those get executed when the controller is named foo no matter what the action is. 
Now, finally, as for the order of execution of these model modules, well, within each directory, they are run simply in alphabetical order, and the order of the directories is that first the models directory itself is always run first, then those modules, if any, in a subdirectory matching the controller name, and then if that directory has a subdirectory which matches the action name, the modules in that directory will run. So for a single request, at most the modules of three different directories will run, and execution always starts with the models directory itself and works downwards through the subdirectories. Now, I would say in a large majority of applications, you're not going to want to have any uh, controller or action specific models. You'll just have everything in the models directory itself. And within that directory, you may not have much cause to have more than just one model module. You very likely may not have any reason to split that one file up into many, uh, as long as it doesn't get too big. In my own Web2Py applications, I tend to start with just two model modules, the first for defining my schema, and then the second for defining what's often called business logic. Basically, it's an API of functions I create to then use in my controller and view modules so that my controller and my view modules don't have to know anything about the internals of the structure of my database schema. How exactly a so-called business logic layer and the reasoning behind it, that's something we'll discuss uh, probably in a supplementary unit in which we actually create a real Web2Py project. The component of Web2Py used to access databases, it calls the DAO, as in Database Abstraction Layer. And as the name implies, it's a library that abstracts over database access, such that using this API, we don't actually talk to the database in SQL. The abstraction layer provides objects and methods, which, when we use, usually gets translated ultimately into SQL. Now, I said usually because some databases which the DAO provides access to aren't actually relational databases using SQL. The DAO supports the database provided by the Google App Engine, which isn't a relational database. So when using the DAO to abstract over the Google App Engine, there's no SQL involved. The methods we invoke with the DAO get translated into uh, whatever the Google App Engine uses. I'm, I'm not familiar. It's something other than SQL is the point. The only caveat to this is that because the Google App Engine is not a SQL database, it's not a relational database, there are some operations with the DAO which don't apply to the Google App Engine. So if you're using that as your backend, certain methods just don't do what they normally do with other backends. In other words, the subtraction layer isn't perfect because all these backends, they can't be abstracted over in exactly the same way. For most of them, we can, more or less, because they're all relational databases using SQL, but even there, there's some differences in what features they support. So, For the most part, though, the DAO operates transparently no matter what your backend is. That is, for whatever your backend, it gives you the same apparent behavior. Now, at the moment, the DAO has support for a good number of different uh, data backends, including SQLite, Postgres, MySQL, the Google App Engine, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, and a number of other options, though these are probably the most commonly used. Now, only one of these will really work out of the box when you install Web2Py without any further setup, and that's SQLite, because SQLite is natively supported in Python itself. In the case of MySQL, um, I believe support comes built in if you're running on Linux. If you're running on Windows, though, I think you need a driver. You need a database driver. Uh, Postgres, you need to install a certain library to get Postgres working with Python. And it's basically different case by case. So there's a little bit of configuration work to get those working with databases other than SQLite. Now, to actually use the DAO, the first thing you're going to want to do is create a connection. A database connection object is created with the class DAO, found in the module glueon.dal, and to the constructor we pass a so-called connection string. Database connection strings are just uh, strings containing all the information the database needs to um, establish a logon. And for most databases, the connection string is expected in the form of a, a URI, like this one here for Postgres and it's specifying first my username Brian with the password, my password, um, and then it specifies the host with the port localhost and 
uh, port 5432, which is the default Postgres port. And then after the slash, we specify the name of the database because remember, for one instance of Postgres, that's a database uh, management system which potentially has more than one database. So you create a database within the management system and that database has a name. So here this is connecting to the database name thing. And assuming there's a user account Brian and this is the valid password and assuming that account has access to a database named thing, then this is a valid connection string and Web2Pi should successfully create a connection object. And we're assigning the connection object here to the variable named DB. And that's a well-established convention in Web2Pi is to always name it just DB. The only reason you'd need to name your connection object variable something else is if you need more than one connection. Otherwise, usually in one request, we're just dealing with one connection. So we just always assign it to DB. So just be clear that the format of the connection string is database specific. So this is an example with Postgres. This is what Postgres connection strings look like. For other databases, most of them look quite similar, but it's really up to each particular database. What you see here are the primary data types that effectively make up the DAO. First, there's the DAO type itself, which as we said, represents the conne a connection to the database. Then a table object represents a table within our schema. Uh, be clear, it's not a table that uh, was returned by a query, it's the actual table that makes up a data type within our database. As you'll see, when we use the DAO to define a table within our database, the object we get back representing that table is of type table. And then within each table of our schema, each column is represented by a field object. Uh, I suppose they went with the term field because it's more generic than column. Column is a relational database specific term, whereas field is a more general term. It doesn't seem as out of place when used in conjunction with a non-relational database like uh, the Google App Engine. Now, if we want to perform on our database a select, update, or delete statement, or the non-relational equivalence thereof for Google App Engine, then we create a query object. And the part that's a bit confusing is what is called a query in Web2Py is not really the same as it's in SQL, because in SQL, a query pretty much refers to just a select statement, whereas updates and deletes are not queries. Um, the query object actually represents the part common to those three different statements. So in a select statement, update statement, and delete statement, you have the part where you're specifying the joining of the tables, and then optionally you have where clauses and other kinds of clauses. Well, those parts are all common to those three different statements, so they're represented together in a single object called query. Once you have a query object, uh, if you want to actually use it to perform a select, update, or delete, you first wrap it in another class called set, and then the set object has three methods, select, update, and delete. And those methods actually trigger the real action. When you define the query, you're just uh, that's just the preliminary stage of defining what kind of select, update, or delete you're going to do later. Now, you're probably wondering why do we wrap queries and set objects to actually perform these operations? And the answer is there isn't any particularly good reason. In fact, I went on the message board and I raised a discussion of, hey, why does this thing exist? Why is there a set class? Why do we have to wrap query objects and set objects? And the answer is that, well, it just, in retrospect, seems to have been a design mistake. The creator, Massimo, said that at some point he suggested to the others that we should change this, and they said, now nah, let's just keep it. So I would argue, if you want to understand what does the set class do, why is it called set? Well, the justification given for that is that the set somehow represents the set of rows which would be selected by the query. It, it doesn't make sense, to be honest. It doesn't really make any sense. So the answer is the set class doesn't do anything. The query class itself should have had the methods select, update, and delete. As it is, they don't. So you have to wrap them in the set object, which has those methods. But that, again, was a design mistake. The query object itself should have those methods. So the oddity of that will be clear when we look at a bit of code. In any case, when you perform a query, when you perform a select, what you get back is an object of type rows, rows plural. And that, as the name implies, represents a set of rows. It's the data returned by the query. 
and a rows object is just a collection of row objects and each row object represents a single row within that result set. Now one important purpose of the whole database abstraction layer is that it abstracts over the variance in data types because databases have their own number types, their own string types, their own date types and so forth but in Python we want to deal with Python types. We want an integer in our Python code to be a Python integer. Also, the whole point with a DAO is that it abstracts over different backends, and different backends, different databases, have different, say, integer types, and different float types, and different text types, and so forth. So, to deal with this problem, the DAO itself has to define uh, its own data types for the columns of the tables. So, here's a list of most of those data types. First, string and text are what you use most commonly to store text data. And whereas a text value can be up to 65,536 characters long, string values only go up to 512 characters, though actually in the case of string you can specify a different length, that's just the default. For cases where you're trying to store text longer than 65,536 characters, um, for that we use a blob. The blob type is generally used to store uh, file content, binary data, but there's no reason that binary data can't be text data. As for booleans, integers, and doubles, well, those should all be self-explanatory. The only uh, thing to keep in mind is that integers and doubles are both constrained to the range of negative 1 times 10 to the power of 100 up to positive 1 times 10 to the 100th power. If, though, you need greater range and or precision, there's also a type called decimal, which we'll talk about in the supplement. And a datetime column, of course, stores a datetime value. In Python, these are expressed as Python datetime objects. And then finally, we have reference fields, reference columns. A reference field is a foreign key to another table. So, for example, if I want my column to be a foreign key to the cats table, then I write reference space cats. And this only works because the DAO automatically gives every table automatically and implicitly a primary key column of type integer and with the name ID. So when you create a reference column, it's always an integer foreign key pointing to the primary key named ID of some other table. Now, to actually create a table, we first have to get a connection to our database using DAO. And then once we have our database connection, here we call it DB, we then invoke on it the method define underscore table. And with the first argument, we specify the name of the table we're defining and then after that, we have any number of field objects representing the columns of this table. And for each field, we first specify the name and then the type. So here we're defining two tables, the first called cat, the second called cat underscore owner. And in the cat table, we're giving it four columns, a column name of type string, a column age of type integer, and a column weight of type double, and then also a column cat owner which is a reference to the cat owner table. So this is a foreign key pointing to the primary key of the cat owner table. Uh, notice though in the cat owner table, we don't define any primary key because as I said, uh, the DAO will automatically give every table a primary key column called ID, which is an integer. So both the cat table and the cat owner table here have primary keys, we just don't explicitly declare them. Having now defined these tables, the connection object, db, will have an attribute for each table we defined. So there's now db.cats, which returns the table object representing that table. And db.cat underscore owner returns the table representing the cat owner table. And within each table object, you have an attribute representing each column. So within the cat owner table, there's dot name, which returns the field object representing that column. So do note there's a bit of a strange asymmetry here because whereas we create actual field objects which we pass to the define table method, we don't create any table object. Um, it almost would make more sense if we were to create a table object first and then pass that to the define table method, but that's not how it works. I imagine simply for the sake of conciseness. Now, be clear that the end effect of invoking define table is to, one, actually create these tables in your database, and also to create these table objects, which you can then interact with in your Python code. The strange part about this is that you will invoke the define tables method to define your tables in every request. 
which sounds odd because wait, you don't want to recreate the tables in the database every single request. That doesn't make any sense. The, once we create the tables the first time, we didn't just want to use the existing tables. So what actually happens is in your application, there's a subdirectory called database in which are kept files describing the tables of your database such that the DAL knows when you invoke to find table whether or not that table already exists and whether therefore needs to actually then create them in the database or not. Only when we use define table to create a new table with a new name does the database actually then create a new table. Likewise, we can modify one of our existing tables by simply say here just removing one of the fields from the cat table or adding in another field. The DAL will then see that the table as you just defined it differs from how it's defined in the database directory and so it will then actually alter the table in the database, which in SQL is done with the alter table statement. Now, in the terminology of databases, when we take an existing schema and we modify or remove one of the existing tables or one of its columns, that's what's called a migration. It's an altering of the schema. I believe it's called a migration because usually it's used in the context of taking data from one database and putting it into another. So there's like migrating from one database to the next. But the term also came to be used in reference to just altering an existing database itself, not just moving your data from one database to another. Basically, a migration means we're changing the structure of the data. And that can be problematic because sometimes you can't just take, say, an existing column and convert all of its values from one data type to another. So while in some circumstances we can successfully and without error perform what's called a auto-migration, basically a migration that's done for us automatically, but in other circumstances we can't get away with an auto-migration because the database is not smart enough to uh, handle the changes for us, or we're, we're going to end up losing data if we try and do an auto-migration. So by default in Web2Py, auto-migrations are enabled, but there's a uh, configuration setting where you can actually disable them, or you can actually disable them on a table by table basis. The defined table takes an optional named argument migrate. If you specify an argument of migrate equals false when you define a table, that will stop the DAO from even trying to create or alter the table as it exists in the database. It will just assume that the table is as you defined it with the defined table method. So the problem there, though, is that there might be a discrepancy and you might get an error later on when you try and actually use that table if it doesn't conform to the definition as you laid out with the defined table. But at least it does ensure that you won't harm your data. So that's why you would set migrate equals false. So to restate what defined table does, it creates a table object and assigns it to an attribute of the connection object. So like db.cats here, but then also it will actually create that table if the table doesn't already exist, or it will modify the existing table of that name if it doesn't conform to the definition we just specified with defined table. Now, once we have our table, we want to put data in it, and we do so with the insert method of the table object. So here we're invoking db.catOwner.insert, and the insert method expects a named argument for each column. So our cat owner table has two columns, name and address, uh, both strings, so we provide a name argument and an address argument. And this inserts a new row in the cat owner table. And remember that every table implicitly has a primary key column named ID of type integer, but that's automatically set. So we don't specify an ID because uh, the database is picking an ID for us. The other notable method of the table object is drop, which when invoked will actually remove the whole table from the database. Of course, removing tables isn't something you'd commonly do in the normal course of an application, but it's there if you need it. Now, to select, update, or delete rows from your database, you need to first create what are called query objects. And the primary means we have for creating queries is not to invoke the query constructor itself, but to actually use these overloaded operators of the field type. The field class has operator methods for the equality operator, the not equality operator, less than, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. So when you use those operators and the left operand is a field object, what you get back is a query object. So we have three examples here. The first expression, db.cat.id greater than zero. Well, first db.cat gets you the table object, and in that table object we have a column ID, which is the primary key of that table. So db.cat.id is the field representing that column. 
And as I just said, the field type overloads the greater than operator. So given the way overloaded Python operators work, this is actually invoking the method double underscore gt double underscore of the field class. And it's passing to it first the field itself, and then as the second argument, the value zero. And what the method returns, what this expression evaluates into, is an as yet unperformed select, delete, or update statement in which we are selecting the rows from cat where cat.id is greater than zero. So to be clear, this just creates an object representing the as yet unperformed select, update, or delete. Likewise, in the second line, first db.cat.id, that's a field object representing the id column of the cat table. And when we use the equality operator on a field object, when field is a left operand, that's actually invoking the method double underscore eq double underscore of the field class. And to that is being passed first the field object itself and then the argument for. So what we get back is a query object representing all the rows in cat where the id value is 4, which of course should be just one row because multiple rows aren't supposed to have the same id. IDs are supposed to be unique. In the last example here, we're again using the equality operator, except now both arguments are fields, not just the left operand. db.cat.cat owner, that is the uh, foreign key column cat owner in the table cat, and db.catowner.id, that's the id column in the cat owner table. So the query object that results represents a selection of rows from the joining of these two tables because we're, we're involving columns from two separate tables, so of course they have to be joined first. So it does an inner join between cat and cat owner, and then we're filtering from that join the rows in which cat.catowner equals catowner.id. So note that the thing a bit peculiar about how we express queries in the DAO is that the joining of tables is sort of left implicit. It's like we're just specifying predicates to filter. And then whether tables get joined together, that's, that's just implied from whether there's more than one table involved. If you just have one table, no tables need to be joined. But uh, because the expression here involves two tables, both cat and cat owner, well, they have to be joined first. So in the query, the join is implicitly there. Now, to actually use these queries to do an actual select, update, or delete, we first have to wrap the query object in a set object because it's the set class which actually has the methods select, update, and delete, which as I discussed earlier, I believe is actually just a mistake in the API. The query object itself should have just had these methods itself, but for whatever reason, this unnecessary complication made it in some, in the early days of Web2Py and it's stuck around since then. So here in this example code, the first line, we're creating a query object uh, with the expression db.cat.id equals two. Uh, remember db.cat.id, that's a field object. The equality operator then is overloaded for field objects, and that method actually returns a query object, which we're assigning to the variable query. Uh, the parentheses around the expression here are not necessary. I just included them for clarity. Um, and then in the next line, the way you get a set object uh, wrapping the query is you pass query to an invocation of the connection itself. It's kind of strange. You don't pass it to a set constructor. Rather, our object representing our database connection, db, is an instance of DAO, and the DAO class includes a method called double underscore call double underscore, and that's effectively overloading the uh, function call operator itself, which is a pair of parentheses. So when we invoke the connection object, db, as if it were like a function, what we're actually doing is invoking that call method. And so query is being passed to that call method, and what it does is it returns uh, a set object wrapping the query. So not only is, is this a step which should be unnecessary, it's done in a very strange way. The justification for this oddity, I assume, is that at the time it seemed like the syntactically most compact way of expressing this common operation, uh, rather than having to create some other method to which we pass both the db object and the query object, you could just invoke the connection object itself and therefore not have to pass it in also as an argument. But again, for whatever reason, that was a mistake because the query object already contains information about the connection because these field objects belong to tables and tables belong to connections. So the query object should have encoded within it knowledge of what the connection object is. So we don't need to introduce it this in this very convoluted way either. All the information that's needed is there in the query object. 
And I guess for whatever reason, when Massimo first created Web2Pi, he just didn't see this. And so he missed this opportunity and introduced this unnecessary complication, which is just stuck around. But anyway, so we have our set object, and now we want to actually perform a select update or delete. Well, say we invoke the delete method, that then performs a delete of all the rows in the cat table where cat ID equals two. If instead we were to invoke update, we would specify a named argument for each column we want to update. And so we'd write lives equal eight to set the lives column to the value eight, uh, name equals fluffy to set the name column to the value fluffy. So this invocation of update will modify all the rows in the cat table where ID equals two, which again is presumably just one row and so the values of lives and name in that column get updated due to the values 8 and fluffy, respectively. Now, with the same query object, if we were to invoke the select method with no arguments, that would perform a select and return the results as a rows object. And because this would be a select over the cat table in which the ID column equals 2, that should, again, be just one row, and to get the individual rows from a rows object, uh, we use the subscript operator just like a list. So rows subscript zero here will return the first row, the first and only in this case. And then uh, with the row object, we can then access the columns by an attribute of the same name. So row.lives here is an expression that should evaluate into whatever value lives has in the column where the ID equals two. Now, if you don't want the select to return all of the columns, you can specify which columns you want by passing field objects to the select method. So here we're just selecting for the columns name and lives of the cat table. And so if we then try and access some other column in one of the row objects, well, that will throw an exception because there is no such attribute because we didn't request it in our select. So here row.wait should throw an exception because the row has no such attribute because we didn't select for that column. Lastly, an important thing to keep in mind about row objects is that if the query involved multiple tables, well, then you might get name collisions between uh, columns of the respective tables. So when your query involves multiple rows, the column values get stored as attributes in storage objects named after the tables. So in our row here, to get at uh, lives of the cat table, we, we write row.cat.lives. Row.cat here is a storage object representing all of the columns uh, of our query from the cat table. For the sake of more complex queries, the query class overrides the ampersand and pipe operators, which effectively then are the and and or operators respectively. So if you want to and two queries together, you connect them with the ampersand operator. If you want to or them together, you connect them with the pipe operator. And then query also overloads the tilde operator to negate a query. But this is a unary operator, not a binary operator, so it always has just one query argument. So we're taking the query object representing cat.catOwner equals catOwner.id, and then we're negating that. So we're filtering for the rows in which cat.catOwner is not equal to catOwner.id. So expressed in terms of SQL, that would look like cat inner join cat owner. There's an inner join because there's two tables here, right? Cat and cat owner. And then the filtering predicate is cat.catOwner not equals to catOwner.id. And that less than, greater than sign, that's just the not equals operator in SQL syntax. So just be clear what's going on here. We're creating a query object with the equality operator uh, from these two field objects. And then we're using the tilde operator on the query object because the query class overloads the tilde operator to act as a negation operator. And that negation operator, the tilde operator, returns a new query object representing the negation of the query that we created with the equality operator. In the second example here, first we're creating two separate query objects with the equality operators. First, cat.catOwner equals catOwner.id, and second, cat.name equals mittens. So we have these two separate query objects, and then we combine them into one query using the ampersand operator which produces a new query, a third query object, that represents the inner join of cat and cat owner with the filtering predicate of cat.catOwner equals catOwner.id and cat.name equals mittens. So it's a composite predicate here with two conditions, uh, two equality tests. And both must be true for the whole predicate to be true. 
So it's selecting for only those rows where cat.catowner equals catowner.id and cat.name equals mittens. Any row in the joint table where that's not the case gets excluded from the result set of rows. Understand that in this example here, the parentheses actually aren't necessary because the equality operator has a higher precedence than the ampersand operator. Uh, I just included the parentheses for clarity. Now, our third example here is exactly the same as our second, just we're using the pipe operator instead of the ampersand. And so in the effective query, instead of the AND operator in the SQL, it's using the OR operator. So it's those rows in which cat.catowner equals catowner.id or cat.name equals mittens. So as long as either one of those is true, then the row is selected. Only when both are false uh, does the row get excluded from the result set. And finally, in our last example, we're taking that same query, but we're just negating the whole thing. And note that does require placing the whole thing in parentheses and then putting the tilde in front. Otherwise, we would just be negating that first uh, query, the cat.catowner equals catowner.id. We want to negate the whole thing. So note the effect of this in the SQL is to take that whole predicate expression and then just apply the not operator to the whole thing. So the end effect of this is to filter for precisely the opposite set of rows from those selected by the third query. So the logical operators of the query class, ampersand, pipe, and the tilde, the negation operator, uh, be clear, they take in query operands and return a new query object. Uh, that's why in the first example here, actually those parentheses are required, because otherwise the tilde would be operating upon not a query object, but the first field object there, db.cat.catowner, which is not valid because the field operator doesn't have a tilde operation. What's happening there is the equality operator of field is producing a query object, and then the negation is operating upon that query to produce a new query. Now, when combining queries using ampersand and pipe, it then becomes possible to get a query involving more than just two tables. And in that case, what happens simply is that all the tables are joined together, and then all of the predicates are applied. So here, for example, first it's again cat.catowner equals catowner.id, but then the second query we're adding to that is dog.name equals fido. So what happens is first the tables cat, catowner, and dog are all joined together, and then we filter with the predicate cat.catowner equals catowner.id and dog name equals fido. So the simple rule is that however many tables are involved in the query, they just get joined together first, then all the predicates are applied. Now, in the usual case of a request, in our model we open a database connection, and if in the course of a request we need to do any sort of database business, we use that connection to uh, performs selects, updates, deletes, uh, inserts, and so forth. And then at the end of a request, when we return a successful response, Web2Pi will then automatically commit the transaction. If, for whatever reason, we need to explicitly commit our transaction, we can do so by invoking db.commit. Assuming, of course, db is our connection object, which is, by convention in Web2Pi, what we normally call our connection object. We normally assign it to a variable db. Uh, and then likewise, if we want to explicitly roll back our transaction to undo any changes we've made, uh, we can invoke db.rollback. And as I mentioned earlier, there are circumstances where a rollback will happen implicitly. If an exception other than the HTTP exception is thrown and not caught in the course of processing a request, then an automatic rollback is performed on any open database connection. So it's not common that we invoke these methods explicitly, but occasionally there are cases when we would call them directly. So by now we've covered most of the essentials of Web2Pi. As for the things we've omitted, well, first off, there are these two special controllers, one called AppAdmin and one called Static. The idea of AppAdmin is it's just a controller included by default when you create a new application, which contains administrative pages for managing the database of your application. So if you want a web interface where you can inspect the data in the database for your application, uh, one is already provided for you in the form of AppAdmin. The so-called static controller isn't really a controller. There's no static.py file in your controller's subdirectory. Rather, in your application directory, there's a subdirectory called static, and any files you place in there can be accessed with a URL where the controller is specified as static. 
and then where the action normally goes, that's where you put the relative path from that static directory. And the special thing about requests to files in static is that they bypass the whole usual request response lifecycle. There's no request object, there's no controller invoked, there's no models invoked, there's no nothing, basically. So all the code in your application gets skipped over, and simply the file itself is served verbatim. And this is useful for certain static resource files, like for example, uh, images in your web pages. You'd likely want to place them in a subdirectory of static, and then any requests for those files will bypass all of the overhead associated normally with a request to Web2Py. So usually your images, your CSS files, your JavaScript files, those are the sorts of things you place under static because you just want to serve them verbatim, no questions asked. Uh, do be clear then that you don't want to put any sensitive in the static directory because you make it public and anyone who requests it, there's no authentication or authorization, it just hands over the file to whoever asks for it. In the welcome application, and in fact any new application you create, which again just uses welcome as its template, uh, you'll find this template file in the views directory called layout.html. A common approach with Web2Py is to start your application off with all your views extending layout.html. If there's anything you don't like in layout.html, you can simply strip it out or modify it, but it's a handy starting point because it includes a lot of the boilerplate, say in the header, that you're going to want to include in your template anyway. Like say, you'll likely want to include jQuery in your pages, and layout.html already does that for you. So for reasons like that, it's handy to start out with layout.html and then simply modify it as you see fit. In the module gluon.tools, there's a class called auth, as in authentication and authorization. And the idea of this class is you instantiate it in your model and it creates tables for users. And the auth class also includes some methods and other things for creating common user authentication and authorization UI stuff, like, uh, like a login menu, where you click login, it presents the form asking for your username and password, and you enter it, and then um, the auth class will then handle the processing of that form. So it's basically just this one big convenience for, for implementing user accounts in your application. And it's quite flexible, so it should suit most needs, while handily sparing you some busy work. What Web2Py calls generic views are basically fallback views, for cases where you create an action, but then don't create a corresponding view for that action. Uh, in some cases, Web2Py will fall back and use one of these generic views. And these views are all really simple, so especially in the case of the generic view for HTML, it's not terribly useful. It's, it's really just there as a developer convenience so that in the course of uh, development you create an action and forget to create a, a corresponding view, you'll get something a bit prettier than just a generic error page. However, these generic views may represent a security hole because they might have your application accidentally reveal some of its internal state uh, information which may be sensitive. So in most production deployments of Web2Py you'll probably want to disable these generic views. URL rewriting refers to a feature whereby the web framework, or actually the web server itself, modifies the URL of the request. And one reason you might want to do the same Web2Py is that Web2Py, by default, uh, prescribes this heavy-handed URL format, which quite verbosely always has you specify an application, a controller, and then an action. Well, what if you have a website where there aren't separate applications, there's just one? Well, in that case, you want to be able to omit the application from the URLs because it just kind of clutters things up and looks ugly. So that would be one reason why you might want to rewrite URLs. When we covered directives in views, we only mentioned include and extend, but there are two we didn't cover, block and super. They aren't terribly complicated, but we'll talk about them in the supplement. Um, also, there are a good number of DAL features we didn't talk about for performing more interesting kinds of queries. Like, you may have noticed, given what we covered, there's no way to express an outer join. It's all inner joins. Well, there is a facility for doing outer joins. It's just a bit convoluted. Also, it is possible to perform subqueries. And then there's other things, like some SQL operators we didn't discuss, like the in operator or the belongs operator, and others like those. And in the supplement, we'll also discuss SQL form and SQL table. SQL form is simply a convenience for automatically generating forms given one or more DAO table objects. 
because very often what we do in web applications is we have the user fill in a form where each field corresponds to the column of the table and from that we then insert a new row given the values filled in by the user. So SQL form is just a convenience for performing that common task. The SQL table object is another convenience which generates an HTML table given some rows object. Given a result set from a query, it then renders that as an HTML table. Again, this is just a convenience for a common task. As I just mentioned, it's very common in web applications to take values entered by users into a form and then insert those into a database or to update one or more rows in a database. What we don't want to happen is for the user to enter improper values, like say to provide a number when we're expecting them to provide their email address or specify their name. Checking for those kinds of problems is called validation. We should validate field values before actually adding them into the database. Because validation is such a common task, Web2Py has a feature called validators for validating forms more conveniently. Another common need of web applications is the ability to cache frequently used data. And by data, we might mean something retrieved from the database or something that we've generated, like say some amount of HTML we've generated. Uh, we don't want to necessarily repeatedly generate the same HTML over and over again, just like we want to avoid having to retrieve the same data over and over again from a database if we can avoid it. So Web2Py includes a handy mechanism for caching. Another common requirement of web applications is internationalization, which refers mainly to the ability to serve the same pages in different languages. And what you wouldn't want to have to do is to have totally separate pages, totally separate views for different languages. Uh, so what we want is some mechanism that allows us to plug in different language text into the same view. So Web2Py has such a mechanism, which we'll discuss in the supplement. And finally, there's the issue of deployment. Actually setting up a web server with Web2Py and setting up a database and hooking those things all together so you have a properly functioning deployment of your web application. For the sake of development, generally you'll just run Web2Py on your local system, and in that case you can just get away using the inbuilt uh, web server, which is called Rocket, and using SQLite as the data backend, but then in a real production website you're going to want to use something more industrial like Apache and Postgres. That's one possible configuration, but there are many others. And we'll talk a bit more about how to do a proper production deployment in our supplement.